I recently wanted to turn my spare closet into an indoor hydroponic vegetable garden that would give me quick access to homegrown produce such as lettuce but required little maintenance and would not cost a fortune to start. I've used all-in-one systems like AeroGarden for several years which are great but I wanted to increase the size of my indoor vegetable garden and create my own layout which led me to DIY hydroponic systems. So come along with me as I show you my process for turning a basic closet into an indoor vegetable garden. As many of you know, there are a variety of different types of hydroponic systems out there where it can almost seem overwhelming for a rookie like myself, but after watching hours worth of videos of other people showing the systems they had built, I decided to start my DIY journey with a DWC style hydroponic system. I owe a lot of credit to the Simple Greens Hydroponics channel and website which helped speed up my learning curve for this style of hydroponics and I highly recommend you check them out if you are just getting started. So I decided to create a DWC and NFT hybrid hydroponic system. I used fence post sleeves to serve as the materials for rails. I use painter's tape to help identify the two rails but this step can probably be avoided if you are only making a two rail system. Afterwards, I marked all my hole measurements on the rails based on the 3D model I created and I will leave a link in the description where you can download a PDF file that will contain all the hole dimensions and measurements necessary for this project. I used a 1 and 1 half inch hole saw to cut out the holes that my net plant cups will be placed in. Since I was drilling into plastic, it is recommended to drill counterclockwise to create a cleaner cut. For the first hole I drilled, I drilled it incorrectly as an example. The better way is to start initially drilling clockwise until the teeth of the hole saw make contact with the plastic and then flip your drill into reverse and finish drilling out the hole in the counterclockwise direction. Here is a close up where you can tell the difference between the first hole that I drilled incorrectly and the other two holes that I drilled out in the reverse direction. If you enjoy these types of videos, let me know by pressing the like button and subscribing as it helps to inform others about this channel and it also motivates me to continue to spend my time making these videos. I would also like to take a quick moment to express my appreciation to Mark for recently signing up to become one of our Patreon supporters. After all my net cup holes were drilled out, I used a sanding drum that is meant for a rotary tool to widen any holes that were a little too small and to clean up any edges. You could bypass this step and just use sandpaper. Next, I used 120 grit sandpaper I had left over from my disc sander to clean up any remaining rough surfaces or hanging plastic material in the holes. To create my maintenance square holes that are 3 inches by 3 inches, I used a drill bit to drill a hole in the corner of the box so that I could insert my jigsaw blade to finish drilling out the box. No, these maintenance holes are optional and you could use this area instead to add more net cups for plants, but I wanted better access to clean out the rails and to access my fittings which we'll be installing later. After the maintenance holes were cut out, I flipped the rails over to drill out the water entrance and exit holes using a 1 and 1 4 inch hole saw. To drill out the rail connection holes, I used a 1 and 3 8 inch hole saw. For the connection holes, it is really important to try to cut out the holes at the same height so that you do not experience any leveling issues when we try to connect the two rails together. To make this critical step easier, once the first hole was cut out, I set the rail against the uncut rail and made sure my work table surface was flat and then used a marker to mark where the hole needed to be cut out on the second rail. I then disconnected my hole saw from my power drill to make it easier for me to pre-align the hole saw over the marked circle and score the plastic surface with a drill bit to create a pallet hole. After both holes were cut out and the rails were side by side, the holes lined up perfectly. Since I was finally done with all the hole cutting, I gave both rails a really good rinse down to get rid of any leftover plastic inside the rails. 
I then moved on to creating the PVC rail connections out of 3 4 inch PVC fittings and pipe. I first cut two 1 and 5 8 inch long PVC pieces from the PVC pipe using a PVC cutter. I then dry fitted all the components together to quickly check for any mistakes. In case some of you are unfamiliar, I will be using a PVC union fitting to make it easier for me to disconnect the two rails from each other if I ever needed to in the future. The union has a rubber o-ring inside to help create a watertight seal. To fuse all the PVC components together, I decided to use Odie's single step PVC cement which does not require me to add primer to the components and it is also safe for potable water applications. Make sure while inserting the PVC pipe into the fittings, the pipe is fully inserted and you turn the PVC about a quarter of a turn for a secure fit. You will also want to hold the pipe and fitting together firmly for at least 30 seconds to prevent pipe push out. You can wipe off any excess cement with some tissue paper if needed for a cleaner look. Once all the PVC components were fused together, I moved on to installing the 3 4 inch bulkhead fitting that the PVC connection would thread into. I also like this type of bulkhead fitting because it comes with double gaskets which helps create a watertight seal. I then installed a 1 half inch barb fitting into the water entrance hole. Afterward, I installed the second bulkhead fitting into the second rail. Lastly, I installed a 3 4 inch barb fitting into the exit hole of the rail system. Once all my fittings were installed, I moved on to installing the post caps for the rails. I used an aquarium silicone sealant recommended by Simple Greens Hydroponics to help secure the caps to the end of the rails. I also did not want to introduce any harmful chemicals into my hydroponic system. I applied about a quarter of an inch bead of sealant around the inner edge of the post cap. Take your time on this step as not doing this properly could lead to a water leak. I also applied some PVC cement to the upper portion of the cap and the edge of the rail as an additional seal. I then attached the post cap to the rail and firmly held the post cap and rail together for about 30 seconds. Once the post caps were installed, I allowed the sealant to cure for a few days. In the meantime, I worked on installing some mylar reflective film on my grow rack to help increase my yield. I highly recommend if you can to purchase a reflective film that is diamond textured to help increase the intensity of your grow lights and spread out the light more evenly. I used a drywall T-square I purchased for another project to help draw an outline for the areas I needed to cut, but this is completely optional. I purchased a metal shelving rack that was large enough to support my new hydroponic grow area and future systems. To attach the mylar film to my grow rack, I used several pieces of velcro sticky back squares to ease the installation process. I first installed the loop pieces of velcro on the rack and then attached the hook pieces. I then took my mylar reflective film and firmly pressed it up against the velcro to adhere the velcro to the reflective film. This makes the process much easier than having to measure where the velcro should be placed on the film. No, I did add more velcro to the rack and reflective film off camera to help increase the holding strength. I then moved on to attaching my LED grow lights to the rack. The grow light kit I received comes with 6 lights but it was recommended by Simple Greens Hydroponics to use 2 lights per rail. I used the included zip ties to hang the grow lights to my rack and left a small gap between the shelf and the light so I could move the lights around later if needed. One feature I like about these lights is that you can connect up to 6 LED grow lights together and only use a single power cord. This makes the installation quicker and cheaper.
To control the time the grow lights turned on and off, I used a simple mechanical timer that has four always on outlets and four time based outlets. I set the timer to turn on my grow lights for 13 hours each day starting at 5 a.m. Now that my sealant was cured, to help make sure I had a watertight seal around my PVC connection between the two rails, I placed Teflon tape around the male threads of the PVC fittings. When placing Teflon tape around the threads, make sure you tightly wrap the tape in a clockwise direction. I usually make at least 3 full passes around the threads. Just as a warning, do not over tighten the PVC fitting into the bulkhead fitting so you do not cause unwanted stress. I usually hand tighten the component so that it is hand tight and then I use straight jaw pliers or a crescent wrench to tighten the fitting an additional half inch. From this view, you can see I did not fully screw the fitting into the bulkhead fitting since it was not necessary and to avoid causing stress issues. The pump I use for my hydroponic system is a basic submersible pump that has a head lift of 5 feet. It is slightly overpowered for my 2 rail setup but if I want to add on to the system I can use the same pump. I use black tubing for this system to reduce the chance of algae growth. I use 1 half inch tubing to attach my water entrance bar fitting to the pump and 3 4 inch tubing for my exit bar fitting. I then worked on drilling the holes for my tubing in my 18 gallon black tote that will be used as my reservoir. I used a 1 and 1 4 inch hole saw to drill out the holes for my water pump's power cable, the air lines from my air pump, and for the exit drain tubing from the rail. I used a 1 inch hole saw to drill out the hole for my water entrance tubing connected to the pump. I used these hole sizes in an all black tote to help reduce the chance of algae growth. If you have a tote that allows light through, you can also spray paint the outside of the tote black. While test running my system, I quickly discovered that the water level in my rails were a lot higher than what I wanted and the issue was that my water pump was a little oversized for the system and my rails water exit hole was too small to handle the high flow rate. To allow water to exit my rails faster, I removed the filter screen from the 3 4 inch bar fitting which simply slides out. While I had the fittings removed, I also took the time to add some more sealant around all the fittings since I experienced a small water leak around my bulkhead fittings while performing the water test. To gain more control over the water flow rate, I also installed a 1 half inch PVC ball valve. I then connected two 1 half inch bar fittings with teflon tape around the threads. Afterwards I cut the black 1 half inch tubing to insert the ball valve in line with the pump. I then hooked everything back up to give the system another test run and found out my modifications fixed my water level issue. I could now better control the water flow rate into the system to allow my second rail to have more time to drain the rail system and keep the water level at the appropriate height for my net cups. In the first rail, the net cups will barely make contact with the water which is enough for my grow media to stay moist. The second rail will have a lower water level because that rail will contain mature plants that will have longer roots that will touch the bottom of the rail so it is not necessary for the net cups to make contact with the water. After all the tests passed, it was time to move and set up the hydroponic rail system in my new grow room. To ensure that the tubing connected to my pump would not easily slide off, it was recommended to add a zip tie near the bottom of the tubing. I then soaked the air stones in water for 30 minutes that will be used later to help oxygenate the water for the plants. While the air stones were soaking, I worked on installing the air pump and airline tubing. My air pump included 4 airline outlets but to help reduce how much airline tubing I would need to use, I decided to cap off the two inner outlets by bridging them together with a piece of tubing and only using the outer two outlets for my 4 air stones. I also put a small towel underneath the pump to reduce vibration noise. 
The airline tubing I purchased came with T-fittings which will allow me to split the airline tube so I can connect two air stones to each main airline. I used some wire strippers to cut the airline tubing since they were nearby but I would recommend using some scissors if you have them. After I had the air stones installed and all facing in the upward position, I went ahead and powered up the air pump to verify everything was working correctly. Note, I plugged my air pump and water pump into the always on outlet as I plan to leave both devices running 24-7. I used the knob on top of the air pump to adjust the air pressure which will increase or decrease how many bubbles are coming out of the air stones. I left mine at a medium high setting. I then worked on 3D printing some caps for the four maintenance holes on my rails. Remember, this part is optional and only necessary if you are replicating my design. I will also leave a link to my 3D file in the description in case you own a 3D printer. However, if you don't, you can also make these caps using cardboard or some other plant safe material that can cover the holes. I then cut out a one and one half inch hole into two of my maintenance caps with a hole saw to give myself two more growing locations. I only cut a hole in two of the caps because if I planted something in the other cap locations, it's possible the plant roots will enter the fittings and clog up the system. I then install hole plugs into the grow holes that currently are not occupying any plant. You can also use a piece of cardboard or something similar that does not allow light to pass through. Afterwards, I added about 14 teaspoons of liquid plant food by Dynagrow into my reservoir. I like that this product has all 6 essential macronutrients and all 10 essential micronutrients required by plants. So it keeps my plant feeding process extremely simple, but it can be a little more expensive than some of the other options out there such as Master Blend 3-step process fertilizer, which I would also recommend. I then moved on to inserting a variety of lettuce seeds into my plant starter cubes. I inserted about one to two seeds into the cubes, but with lettuce, you are probably okay with one seed since they usually do not have issues with germination. Once everything was planted and inserted into the hydroponic system, it was time to sit back and wait for the first set of plants to grow. Since I initially was not aware of how important adjusting and monitoring the pH of water was, I ended up having to restart the growing process a few times. I eventually started to get the hang of things from researching online and from Caleb over at Simple Greens Hydroponics and was able to finally start making some decent progress with the system. Here you can see a short time lapse of the lettuce growing as I continue to move the lettuce further up the rail system. When it comes to electricity costs to run this system, for my location it only cost me about $10 extra per month. Overall, this was an exciting experience to be able to walk into my grow room and see healthy vegetables ready to harvest and eat. Also, I am not sponsored by Simple Greens Hydroponics, but I believe in giving credit when credit is due and I want to thank Caleb over at Simple Greens Hydroponics who provided a lot of helpful information for this type of system. And if you want to gain a deeper understanding about this system, definitely check out his YouTube channel and Udemy course. He goes into a lot more detail than I do in this video. Also, I moved my air stones into my maintenance holes as an experiment I was conducting throughout the process, but later found out it was not necessary, so I later moved them back into my reservoir. Anyway, this has been fun, and if you found this video useful or think others might, be sure to like and subscribe to encourage YouTube to share this video with others. Until next time, thanks for watching.